Women marry men in the hopes that he will change. Men marry women hoping she will never change. She can stay as beautiful forever like that, as agreeable and nice and so on. Women marry men hoping that this man is going to increase in wisdom, in intellect, in finances, in his career, in everything. But they don't communicate it to you. So you go into your logical man brain and you're like, oh, wow, this is an amazing arrangement. Not realizing that she is banking on you becoming someone else. And if you don't, you are on a time bomb. society is so amazing and moral and, and progressive and first world country, then why are we suffering with these internal societal diseases? Things like drinking, things like smoking, things like zina, things like music, pornography. Why? It's because they don't actually care about morality. They care about desire. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to the Realist Podcast in the Donia of the Three Muslims, where we are joined for yet another Sunday where we are going to bash and oppress women. I'm just playing. We don't, we, we don't really do that, but people think we do. I don't really know why. But we have a very special guest today, Mahdi Returns. Y'all hashtag it. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah for having me back, Ikhwan. I've been really enjoying your content. Some very interesting discussions you've been having. Uh, I've learned a lot of new things. I learned a lot about feminism from one of the, the brothers you had on. I forget his name. Daniel uh, Hakikichi. Light skin brother. And the history of feminism. I found it to be fascinating. So you're doing some excellent work, mashallah. Much appreciated. Yeah. Jazakallah. Allah, Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you. I think you're talking about uh, Daniel Hakikichu. Yes, Daniel. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mashallah. That brother. Uh, alhamdulillah, man. Jazakallah khair. And, um, you know, with our journey and sharing this knowledge... This is why we have you on, mashallah, because you, as you proved in the last episode, have a lot of wisdom to share, mashallah, from what you've learned and read about and, and practiced in life. So with that being said, let's kick off this episode, inshallah. Fayad, man. Bro, when I think about Mahar, I think about Sunnah. When I think about Allah, you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and just the teachings of Islam, I put that above all else. If I have one type of view and you come and you show me Allah or his messenger وسلم, and what they stand for and what they impose on us and want us to follow, I'm going to change my views. I'm going to do a little bit of research. I'm going to see, you know, the hadith, the ayah, and I'm willing to change. But you got people today, you got feminists, you got women that even that's not enough. And I feel like if you don't fear Allah, then I don't think anything can uh, be worthy or important that you can fear. With that being said, it's sunnah to have a mahar as low as possible. Yet today, girls be moving and acting like it's sunnah to have a mahar as high as possible. So Mahdi, do you have any psychological underpinnings of that that you can maybe, you know, share wisdom or enlighten us on? Do you have any experience with that? Do you know why women expect that a 15, 20, 30, 40K mahar is actually low compared to some of the ones that they've seen and they use that as an argument? This is a great question that we're going to have to answer from so many different angles. So, Bismillah, Rabbi Shrah li Sadri, Wesir li Amri Wahri Al Uqad, that Hamil li Sani, Yafahu Qawli. Every time I do an interview like this or I do a talk on something, at the end of it, I always like, ah, oh, I should have said that. So, I hope I, I get it all out this time, inshallah. inshallah. Okay, first and foremost, as I said, oh, wow. yes, the Sunnah is for it to be lower. However, <clears throat> or to be as close to the sunnah of the, the mahar, either mahar fatimi or what the Prophet ﷺ himself paid for his wives, which is the equivalent of around 800 pounds sterling. I, I forget the exact weight in silver, but if you were to equate it, it's around 800 pounds sterling, maybe $600, right? Firstly and foremost, you will notice that the only girls, women, who make those types of videos, I expect this much, I expect 15K, 20K, and so on, they're young girls. You're not going to catch a 40 plus year old woman taking those videos. You're not going to catch a 35 year old plus woman taking those videos. What does that tell you? What it tells you is on some level of consciousness, a woman knows 
that her primary value or desirability to a man is intimately connected to her youth, youth, beauty, fertility. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. Otherwise, we'd have 50-year-old sisters taking the same videos. They don't. So that's the first thing. On some level of consciousness, she knows, whether she acknowledges it or not, that what makes me most desirable to a man is the fact that I'm young and I'm looking the best that I can, I would possibly look and I'm fertile and so on. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. I always tell brothers, if the sister is not willing, she, she puts a number out there. She says, I want $10,000 mahar, right? And you say, sister, uh, you know, I can't, I can't meet, I can't afford that, whatever the case may be. And she says to you, brother, if you can't meet that, then I'm not interested in you. You should immediately walk away, not because of the money, but because the only reason, the, the main motive for her to marry you is you meeting that number in the first place. What she is telling you is, bro, I don't rate you like that. Because a woman, she makes rules for men she doesn't rate and breaks rules for men she does rate. You want a sister who will pay you to take her. Now, before the audience gets all upset, I'm not saying sisters should pay brothers a mahar. No, that's not the point. Don't miss the point. The point that I'm making is when a woman has that burning desire, that need to be with you, she'll break all sorts of rules just so that she can be with you. She is too scared to lose you. That's the type of sister you want to marry. If a sister is saying, well, you know what, Habibi, if you don't meet this, then I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to move on and see what else I can find. What she is subcommunicating to you is, bro, I don't rate you like that. You're going to have to take that L and keep it moving. Even if you could save the money for it, don't. Don't do that. Don't go and work for 12 months and save the money because she doesn't desire you like that. And the fundamental problem is not the money. The fundamental problem is you. She doesn't rate you like that for whatever reason. Take that L and then work on yourself. Become a better version of yourself. And that's it. That's my, that's my view on that mahar thing. Because all of these Man. girls, every single last one of them, will lie. all of them. Once she finds that brother whom she deems, this guy is like, he's the man. For whatever reason, it doesn't matter even if he's not. What matters is her perception. She will pull hell and high water to make sure she can be with him. She's not going to let him go. Okay, so there's there's two things on my mind. First thing is you made a TikTok or uh, an Instagram live, something about why girls want a high mahar, something about how they're just objectifying and commoditizing. I want you to go into that. Second thing is, what do you say to sisters who don't want it for them, but it's my parents that they want the high mahar, it's the family honor or whatever. So let's go through those one by one. Okay, so the first one was what? Remind me again. It was what you went on something about the psychology of mahar, why girls commoditize or objectify, why they even want a high mahar to begin with. So yeah. enlighten our viewers, bro. Well, there's a number of reasons. Firstly and foremost, we live in a globalized sexual marketplace now. You've probably heard this term before. Globalized sexual marketplace. How since the advent of social media, all women and men for that matter, even if she lives in the most remote part of the desert somewhere, if she's got an internet connection, she can see the Dan Bilzerians of the Muslim world. She can see the whoever else are going on in the Muslim world, the proverbial high value man in the Muslim, in the Muslim world. So now all women, all women who have an internet connection desire one type of man, the proverbial high value man, the 1% man, the man who has his, not only his dean in check and his body in check and so on, but he has his finances in check to a high degree, right? This has created a problem now. The problem is this, all women desire one type of man, principally, that's their first choice, but there ain't enough of those type of men to go around. So the game has been rigged. If you're that type of man, that 1% man, you have too many options. And if you're not, you've got a big problem in your hands. And this is why I tell the brothers to level up. But in terms of why do they make these demands? Well, because they've been exposed online through their internet connections, through Instagram. The only type of accounts that they follow are brothers who are projecting a high value lifestyle. And the danger with internet is wherever you follow and see most frequently, you start to think it's the norm. You start to think it's normal for a brother to earn $100,000 a year. Adi, I see Mustafa, he's earning way more than that. And Ahmed and Bilal and all these guys I follow, that's like standard procedure now. You should be earning a million. When the truth is less than 14% of the US population 
earn 100,000 a year. That's not just men. That's men, women, gays, uh, married men. So you want to take out that tiny percentage of available Muslim men who want heterosexual. to Heterosexual. Heterosexual Muslim men. Hey, hey the non-binary too. Come on. No. <laughs> <laughs> going to be here all day with that. <laughs> then you've got a tiny, tiny fraction of men to choose from, but mm. the women don't see it like that because they're following all these guys who or they have exposure at least to all of these brothers who have this type of lifestyle and they're on the dean and they think that's adi that's normal and if they meet a brother who's not meeting that expectation she's like you're a bum when the truth is this is this is like a fallacy this is a facade and as a result of that why do they command these high prices well as i said on some level of consciousness women innately know what makes them most desirable to a man is their youth, beauty, fertility. Now, before the ladies get all upset and start writing in the comments, hating and so on, I didn't say what only makes you valuable, but pri what makes you primarily desirable to a man, well, that's connected to your youth, beauty, fertility. And these girls know it on some level of consciousness, which is why they're taking these TikTok videos. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. But even with that all being said, Ikhwan, even with that all being said, believe me, if that same girl who took that TikTok video Commanding, demanding 60,000, 70,000, whatever. If she meets a brother whom she feels is, is a 1% man, for whatever reason, the reality is irrelevant. What matters is her perception. She will pay him to take her. That's the type of, that's the type of sister that you want. A woman who is prepared to put down all of these, these rules that she has made just to be with you. That's the type of sister that you want. Does that answer the question? It does, it does. But go go a little bit more into, you know, why they want, why they misconstrue high mahar with high value in themselves. Okay. You see, there's a bit of cognitive dissonance going on here. And I was watching a tea talk. There's a, some sisters, they, they've got a YouTube channel called Tea Talk. And on the one hand, I could immediately see, I forget the sister's name. She was talking about how, you know, you should, if you want to command, if you want to demand a few thousand pound or 10,000 pound for your mahar, go for it, sister. You know, maybe you want to start a business. I was like, mashallah, like, what am I? Some type of bank or something? Funding for a business. Uh, man tander. Man tander banking. First of all. Second of all, I'll give you money for a business that's going to keep you away from the home. Why would I do that? But then at the same time, at the same time, she quickly comes back on herself and says, but sisters, you're not commoditizing yourself. Remember, your, your, your worth is invaluable. Okay, tamam, but this is cognitive dissonance. On the one hand, you refuse to come down. But on the other hand, you're saying you're, you, are, you, are, you can't monetize your worth. And I'm telling you, Ikhwan, all of these sisters who have these numbers in place, all of them, every single one of them, will, their demands will melt away the moment they meet a man whom they deem worthy. It's irrelevant. So when a sister is fighting you on it, you as a man need to understand she doesn't really care about the money. She's just looking at you and thinking, bro, you're not the one. For whatever reason, I think you're slacking somewhere. I don't rate you like that. And you as a man have to take that L. A man's logical reaction is, right, I need to get another job. I need to earn more money so I can make that money and give it to her. Don't do that because the money was never the problem. For whatever reason, she thinks you're not the one. Take the L, move on. Yeah, I just wanted to um, clear something up. It's not that we're not saying you are the problem. We're saying... You don't do it for her. And it's okay. You're not going to do it for everyone. You could do it for her. You could do it for her. You might not do it for her. You might not do it for her. It's okay. Your yeah. job isn't here to do it for everyone. Right? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yes. You know, we talked about, you know, there's stories about, you know, Yusuf Alayhi Salam and, you know, some people just do it for everyone. I'm talking about today, the average man, or I would even say 99% of men won't do it for everyone. Maybe even 100%. Those people you see, even even if you see like girls drooling over a, a guy on TV, like one of those people on a, a movie or like an actor, you'll still find some sisters that don't find that guy attractive. Yeah. So it's not it's not a universal thing. So if you don't do it for a girl before marriage, why do you think you're going to do it for a girl after marriage? Hmm. 100%. 100%. But what I will say on that point is it's a numbers game. Yes, the average man, maybe one sister he does it for, another sister he doesn't do it for. But the higher value you become as a man, and let's just define this term high value man first because mm -hmm. it's flying around, right? So let's clearly define it. Well, firstly and foremostly, we're Muslims, right? So we have to be talking about the deen. 
How, what's your, is your deen high value? What's your character like? Um, and then after that, we can start talking about finance, you know, the more dunya type affairs, his deen, his character, his health, how, what type of uh, fitness is he in? And then of course, his finances. We can't ignore this aspect. The higher value you become in all of those departments, the more women you will do it for. You see, and that's why I encourage young men, the game is rigged, Ikhwan. We live in a rigged game. Before, every man could get, a, could get a sister with relative ease because she wasn't exposed to this globalized sexual marketplace. Now, look, we're men, we're hunters, we adapt. That's what we do. Okay, fine. The odds are stacked against me. No problem. I'll run faster. Run faster. Compete harder. Break that glass ceiling. And then all the options will open up to you. I was sitting with a, a multimillionaire the other day. And I can't name him for confidential reasons. He's a young man. He's 28 years old. Very, very successful. Very highly connected. This, this brother, some of his clients, he has over 50 clients. Is, is in a high ticket, high ticket environment. Six of his clients are billionaires. And he said to me, Mahdi, he said, you don't understand what happens once you unlock a certain level of finance. He's a practicing brother. Yeah. Once you unlock a certain level in life, in terms of your finances, you unlock so many other levels. And he said, Wallahi is a fitna. It's hard because you are no longer the hunter. You become the hunted. Mm -hmm. Women start hunting you. Yeah. Everyone starts hunting you for that matter. And you've got so many options available to you. Now, is it easy to break that glass ceiling? No, it's very hard. That's the point. But if you do, yes, the options open up to, to you and you will, you will check the boxes of more sisters. What's a glass ceiling? A glass ceiling is, it looks oh, like... Oh, no, no, I, I, I know that, but uh, which, what's the glass ceiling in this case? How well, much? Well, we're talking about finances. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you want to break into the top 10% of, of earners, you're looking at $150,000 a year. But that's just the money side. Just because mm -hmm. you've got money doesn't necessarily mean you're a good human being, especially mm -hmm. as Muslims, right? So money-wise, $150,000 a year, top 10%. But after that, we have to look at his dean, his character. Is he physically healthy and so on? And then you can see, Ikhwan, once you start putting all of these parameters in place, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of men who actually check all of those boxes. Unfortunately, all women want that tiny percentage of men. So I say to the brothers, don't take that, the, the proverbial black pill and give up on life. Forget that. Run faster, run harder, unlock those levels. And then you will see, you will have the reverse problem. You will be the hunted. You're no longer the hunter. Now you combine that with most girls today being selfish more than ever and them being against polygyny. It just further creates less and less men for the amount of women. Because it's one thing you saying there's 1% there's of, of you know, all men or even 0.1% that are <laughs> that man, that high value man. <laughs> now you get them to pair with one man or with one man. What am I saying? With one woman. <laughs> then it's just not, bro. I think I think Anho just lost it, bro. We lost Anho. I have a, I have a, view. <sighs> I have a view on polygyny actually, and this mm -hmm. might this might sound controversial. I don't believe anything has changed with the regards to women's opinion on polygyny from 1400 years ago to now. I believe that their feeling and their view towards it is exactly the same, and I'll explain to you why. All women will accept polygyny. I'll say it again. All women, even the most anti-polygynous woman, will accept women, well, sorry, will accept polygyny for the right type of man, mm -hmm. for the high value man. They all break rules for men they rate. Women don't have a problem with polygyny per se. They have a problem with doing polygyny with an average man. And this is the existential fear of a woman is that, on the one hand, she wants to pair with the high value man. But on the other hand, she kind of knows it's probably not going to happen. And she knows she's going to marry an average dude, which is fine. Most men are average, right? But then her fear is, hold on a minute. You're an average brother. You make an average living. You earn average money. Your dean is average. Your phys fitness and physical health is average. Your, your wisdom and intellect is average. And then you're going to bring another woman into the equation to share that average with someone else. That's the existential fear, is that mm. you're not high value enough to entertain these thoughts. Now, mm. as, as Muslims, you don't have to, 
if we want to be technical, you don't have to uh, be the high value man to take on another wife. There are you, you, ways that you can skirt around it. Miss Yard, for example, uh, which I don't recommend to the brothers and we can get into that afterwards. I've done that, I've experienced that. It's not a good idea. But again, on some level of consciousness, she knows if I end up with the average brother, I don't want to share him with another woman because he's average. And I kind of get that. So I say to the brothers, you want to do polygyny? Okay, fine. Make sure you do it properly. You want to have the upper hand. You want to, you want to be the one who has the, the, the upper hand, the position of giving. Not a position of vulnerability where you marry a woman and you can't really afford to take care of her. And now you're operating in her frame. And now you've got hell going on back home with the first wife. These are all my personal experiences, by the way. Mm. Uh, I married a second wife. She said to me, Mahdi, I don't want, I don't want any money from you. Nights, you can give me as many or as little as possible. It's completely up to you. And I was like, hey, yo, this is amazing. A woman's sister's coming to me, saying to me, basically, like, I hate to be crude, but free sex, basically. This, this is how the mind comprehends. My father, he gave me a warning before I married her. He said to me, Mahdi, be careful. Women change. Their feelings change after marriage. Lo and behold, he was completely right. And I don't blame the sister. I'm not married to her anymore. I don't blame her because... Women marry men in the hopes that men will change. Men marry women in the hopes that she will never change. Do you see the difference? Man, damn. Bro, say that one more time, bro. That's, that's something. We need that in a t-shirt, bro. Right. Women marry men in the hopes that he will change. Men marry women hoping she will never change. She can stay as beautiful, forever like that, as agreeable and nice and so on. Women marry men hoping that this man is going to increase in wisdom in intellect in finances in his career in everything but they don't communicate it to you so you go into your logical man brain and you're like oh wow this is an amazing arrangement not realizing that she is banking on you becoming someone else and if you don't you are on a time bomb the timer is ticking if you don't pattern up quick enough especially in a relationship in a polygynous relationship you've got two wives and you're on the lower hand and you know, you're not supporting both of them, you're on a time until she loses patience with you. And then all sorts of chaos breaks out after that. SubhanAllah. She's basically investing in you. Yeah. She's investing in you. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Exactly that. Because look, women can say as much as they're like, we don't need men and all the rest of it. No, you don't just need men. You will die without men. <laughs> men, will not, men will not die without women, but you will die without men. We will, we're, not, we're better together, we're happier together, but a woman's survival is dependent upon a man. These uh, services that we take for granted, whether it's the bin man, whether it's the sewage, whether it's the electricity, all of those types of professions are handled, high-risk professions are handled by men. So on some mm -hmm. level of consciousness, a woman knows this and she expects you as a man to step into that role. And if you don't, that's when problems break out in a relationship. Bro, just look Damn. around you. Look at the house you're living in. Look at the look at the furniture that you have around you. Look at the electricity you're running. Look at the lights. Look at everything. Look at the sewage. Look at the water. Mm. Men built the world that we live in right now. I watched a video by Kevin Samuels where he said that. Men literally built the world that we live in right now. Women are just living in it. Right. You get me? And, and women don't like this. They feel like, well, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm listening to a book right now called The Boy Crisis. It's a, oh, wallahi, this book has had me near to tears so many times. And he talks about, there's a boy crisis now, now, right now, Dr. Will Farrell. Anyway, he talks about in times of poverty and hardship, boys are more desirable to have. Why? Because during times of poverty and hardship, we need men to ensure that we have security. Yeah. Flip that around now, Google, have get, you can actually see the, how many times people have typed into Google what type of food should I eat to conceive either a boy or a girl? The search results for what type of food should I eat to conceive a girl happen four times more often than it does for a boy. Why? Because now in times of prosperity and ease, which is what we're experiencing in the West, it's more desirable to have a girl. Because in times of prosperity and ease, the privilege pendulum swings towards women. As you can see today, women have more privileges today across the board no, no, I'm not going to like hearing this in a, in a prosperous society that is excelling. And even Google search results have fed this back to us that people generally Let, want to have more girls than boys. Mm -hmm. Let's put Google aside too. How many things don't make it to the search results? How many women are out here in feminist pages saying, I'm only going to abort it if it's a man 
or like if it's a boy like i want to selectively have girls only because i want a world without girls how paradoxical is that that's, bro. that's the female psyche bro i don't want to talk ish about women but a world with just women bro that's gonna what one generation that's it mm-hmm. bro think about this um my day, i don't know if you've seen this but uh they have this show uh what's it called fired i think survival or something like that the the island with bear grills i watched yeah. that i watched that yeah, yeah, yeah. so you've seen it yeah. you've seen it when they have all the girls and at first uh, you had all these feminists commenting like, oh, why don't you have girls? Like if if you had the girls only island, like they would be so much better. So much they better. would do everything so much like efficiently. Bro, like they had all the girls and it was terrible. I well, mean, the, the amount of t- I, I, someone sent me a program afterwards, which I haven't watched it all yet, but apparently uh, the island for girls was rigged. Now, I haven't watched the program. But it was. It was. Mm-hmm. Is it true that it was rigged? Oh, they had mm-hmm. pigs and and freaking just animals just coming to them and then right. for the mans they were literally like hunting they were getting alligators yeah. Yeah. hunting bro even right. even in when in the pilot bro they they dropped the men off like literally like i would say like maybe like 200 or, or 100 meters away from the shore and they had to swim in the current and for women they literally just dropped them like to the shore bro and i was just like right. okay cool that's not you know sexist and then when it starts out um you know, a couple episodes in, men ended up, you know, going more towards their gender roles of hunter-gatherers or hunters and, you know, women started going more towards, you know, vegetables, taking care of the home, making it look pretty. So yes. as much as they say they could do what a man can do, if not better, they still resorted to their own roles. And they failed one thing before you go on. Men understood that even in the group of men, they need one leader. Hmm. Why? Because, you know, you, you don't you don't want to take my value for it. Go watch some of Matthew's videos where he talks about how a business can't have two CEOs. A country can't have two presidents. Right. So you can't have two competing forces. It doesn't make sense. There has to be that diametrically opposed polarity between a leader and a follower. And usually men are naturally better leaders and women are naturally better followers. But my point is, in the men's group, men who are dominant by nature understood this philosophy and they submitted themselves to one man. Usually, I think there were two or three leaders but but there were there were never two at one time for the women they started out like oh we don't follow patriarchal misogynistic uh, you know ways of operating we cannot we can all be co-partners and co-equal we don't need to have a boss and then what happened was they just bro i think one of the girls almost died from dehydration day two. First 48 hours first 48 hours bro yeah i mean that's a very important i'm glad you made that point because it's about to get to it that you notice in that program, the island, that um, women uh, re- refer to their natural inclination, which is communitarianism, which is if men are the hunters, it means that women are women are the gatherers, right? And women operate best in a community, and they have a natural aversion towards hierarchy. Hierarchy it tr- also translates in their minds as patriarchy, and patriarchy. I would be learned if you say that word now. Yeah, it's like it's like a curse word. You can't say that word anymore. And as you mentioned, Fayyad, they reverted to their fitra of communitarianism, which is good, so long as there's a leader. The communitarianism is, you know, you're in a community, everyone helps each other out, there's no hierarchies. That works well, so long as there is a hierarchy monitoring the situation, you see? But on its own, left to its own devices, if you don't have a leader, you have a headless chicken running around. There needs to be a hierarchy and, and uh, as oppressive as that sounds, what, someone has more power? Yes, but power comes with, pr- the privilege of power comes with responsibility. The more power you have, the more responsibility you have on your shoulders. Don't think that this business of power and, uh, is a privilege and is unfair. No, the more power you have, the more of a position of responsibility and therefore accountability that, you ha- you, that is upon you. And it reminds me of something I read in Robert Greene's book. And I'm going to have to paraphrase here. It's the book, The The Laws of Human Nature. And I'll have to paraphrase because I don't remember the exact wording. But it was to the effect of those individuals who wax lyrical about um, uh, parents, sorry, who say that their children should make their own decisions to the point where the child should, should choose its own gender. He said they do it under the guise of, I don't want to influence him. I don't want to object uh, sorry i don't want to oppress him with my point of view and, and how i feel and so on 
He said, in reality, it's an aversion from responsibility because making tough decisions comes with facing the music of, and the responsibility of possibly making a bad decision. And people who don't want to take on responsibility don't do it for altruistic reasons. They do it because they're scared to be criticized if they do something wrong. And that's the whole philosophy here. I don't want to be a leader. We don't need a leader. Don't think that this is because, mashallah, everyone's so nice. No, it's because nobody wants to take responsibility. No one person wants to take responsibility for the bad things that happens to the group. Mm -hmm. Rami, bro, can you write these two points down in case I forget? So we got to talk about uh, gender roles and then we're going to go into hyper femininity. Um, so first thing I wanted to touch on, well, I'll do hyper femininity first, is there's a spectrum of femininity or feminine or female energy that women have. Right. So in one end, you got masculinity. It's like really low as in insufficiency and in femininity. We don't want that. Ideally, we don't want women like that. They're not, their fitras corrupted. We're not going to get into that. But that's masculine women, right? Then you got feminine, right? Which is like a nice balance. Then you got hyper femininity. So people think that more feminine women are better, or the more feminine energy or higher femininity a woman has is better. That's, count, that's not really the case in all cases. See, masculine women, we all know that they're not for our purposes. We don't want them. Hyper feminine women aren't good either. Hyper feminine women have too much femininity. Think of gold diggers or women that they're just too feminine, too emotional. They don't even have that uckle. They don't even have that intellect. They don't even have any logic or rationale. They're not good either. These are the women that they're just, they're so hypergamous. They're so commoditizing or objectifying themselves, right? Girls that are adult film stars or have only fans or they, they're gold diggers. Bro, if she, if she got with you because she's so feminine, like, don't take this the wrong way, but so feminine that she wants you to be a provider so much that she's going to monopolize you off your money. Then what makes you think another guy can't come across with a fatter wallet and then she's just going to leave for him, right? So hyper feminine girl isn't what you want. You don't want a masculine girl either. You want a feminine girl. Feminine as in she's so balanced in her psyche. She has those logical and rational traits to put Allah first, to put the deen first. She has a conscience, but she has that femininity so that she can turn that off. And women are either, either going to be the first one or the third one, the last one, which is hyperfeminity. Today, this is from what I've seen. Women that are masculine, by and large, feminism, liberalism, whatever. Hyperfemininity, it's kind of the other side, right? You want a girl that's the di- like one in 100, one in 1,000. You can't really find that today as easily but as Mahdi said if you want to increase your prospects increase how many options you have become the high value man so if before you had one option now you have a hundred and if it's one in a hundred then you still got that one but if you only have masculine girls if you only have hyper feminine girls then it's not the case the easy way you spot a hyper feminine girl is she wants you for what you are not who you are like Mahdi said if you don't do it for her if it's the money and you know that's it then you don't want her anyway you want a girl that wants you for who you are not a girl on the other side either masculine girl that that wants a partner you know i'll do the dishes today you do the dishes tomorrow i'll cook today you cook tomorrow so this brings me into gender roles before we go in i want angel and rami to let me know why do you think gender roles are naturally part of our fitra to follow as men and women Go on to that, bro. You smiling, bro. I'm smiling because uh, I I have this uh, thing that I was going to say about the meha, but we're, we're kind of past that. Okay, no worries, bro. I mean, I don't mind if you want to slip it in, bro. If it's, if it's... Yeah, slip it in, bro. Wait, wait. You want me to slip it in? Pause. <laughs> <laughs> bro, just, on, just now, do it, bro. bro. Oh, slide it in. Well, all right. Well, right. Bismillah. So, um, y'all ever played Pokemon? I know Fire has. When I was younger, yeah. Yeah, okay. How about you, Rami? No, I'm the odd one out, man. I haven't. <laughs> I'm, tr- I I'm trying to rationalize how he's going to bring it into gender roles, bro, but bismillah. I'm about to leave the chat. It's about Meher, I think. <laughs> this guy. All right, go. All right, so, um, in Pokemon, uh, you basically have to catch a Pokemon, right? And most of y'all will understand this. This is the whole point of the game. You you catch them, you train them, 
you level them up and you, you try to like catch all the Pokemon. All right. Now there was this one place that like you could buy this Pokemon. I don't know if y'all remember this, but yeah, I think it was like Polygon or, or something like that. And I remember buying this Pokemon and it was just a throwaway Pokemon. Like I hated the fact that I had to buy this Pokemon. And then like you had the choice of like letting these, uh, these things go. Like you could, if you had like, let's say uh, five of them, you could let one go. Like you could just free it. Bro, the moment that I bought this Pokemon, I let it go. I was like, man, I don't want you. I just got you for the the data. That's it. Like, go ahead, be on your way, bro. And like the, the Pokemon, yo, the Pokemon. Your PC? The hell no. The Pokemon <laughs> that like I was really about was the one where it's like, yo, you had to save before going up to it, and then like once you went up to it, you had to like get him down to like that much HP. You had to put him to sleep. You had to paralyze him. You had to burn him. You had to throw like all your balls, bro. You had to use the Master Ball on this Pokemon. That's the one where I was like, yo, I like this Pokemon right here. And I feel like that's how it is with women. Where it's like a woman who's asking for a high meta. Like, bro, I see you as like that that Pokemon where it's like, listen, I might just get the data and just let you go. Like, be on your way. Damn. <laughs> Real talk. Nah, that's funny, bro. You know what it is? Like I said, Juan, when all of these girls, all of them, 100% of them who have these high demands for Mahat, if she comes across a brother whom she deems worthy or she deems as, you know, like this man has a, either he's already made or he looks like he's going places, right? He looks like he's going somewhere. All of that mahad nonsense goes out the window. Trust me. These girls who are waxing lyrical about the importance of her having 20 grand, it's my right and so on. All of them, without exception, will forget all about the mahad. If she comes across a brother whom she feels like, if I let this girl, this man go, I'm going to be making a big mistake. So I say to the brothers, don't worry yourself too much with Mahat. Mm. And if you're, if you're experiencing those L's, that's okay. It means one of two things. Either she was the problem or you're the problem. And what I like to say to the, to, to the brothers is, you don't want to play the 50-50 game of, oh, maybe she's the problem. Now, forget that. It's always you. It's always on you. If you yeah. can adopt this mindset of, it's always I was always the problem. It was always my fault. I did something wrong. Even when it's not true, now you have an opportunity to start digging into the details. Where do I need to improve as a man? What did I do wrong? You can start breaking it down and taking the whole thing apart. And this yeah. is very empowering. If we go through our life saying, oh, you know what? Oh, this sister, this, and that sister, that. Yeah, okay, maybe, maybe you got a point, but that doesn't help you as a man. Yeah. It's all about control. As men, a man's self-esteem is intimately tied to his sense of power, control, and the respect other people have for his opinions. I'm quoting Robert Greene once again. I'll say it again. A man's self-esteem is intimately tied to his sense of power, control, and respect other people have for his opinions. And before people get upset about, oh, power, that's a bad thing. If power is a bad thing, then it means powerlessness is a good thing. It's impossible. Powerlessness is a bad thing, which means power is a good thing if it is yield wielded correctly. Okay? So... Always assume that you're the problem. If you can do that, you've got a better chance of actually fixing what may be wrong with you because we all have issues with ourselves. And mm -hmm. then becoming the proverbial high value man, breaking that glass ceiling and tick checking all those boxes across the board, not just with your money. Always mm -hmm. assume you as a man are the problem. Yep. Oh, yep. That's literally why I love the red pill. Now, before any of you sisters or Muslimas come at me and say, oh, aren't you guys a Dawah channel? Aren't you guys uh, supposed to, you know, not follow Red Pill? Here's the thing. Red Pill, by definition, means the truth. Objectivity, seeing it as it is. So if Islam is the truth, that's just what it is. Yeah. Now, a lot of people say, okay, if you're, if you're a Red Pill Muslim or, you know, you're about this alpha male life or whatever they say, they don't even know what they're talking about. It's anti-Islamic. No. Feminism is anti-Islamic. Mm -hmm. MGTOW is anti-Islamic. Black pill is anti-Islamic. Not red pill. Red pill is not anti-Islamic. So that's essentially what it teaches. Now, before we go into gender roles, I, wanted, I, I love what you said, Mahdi, so far. I wanted to touch on a point that men oftentimes have this issue stem from this unfulfilled cathection of their feminine energy. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what I mean by this is men have feminine energy and masculine energy. I talked about this in episode 18, but again, we're 50 something now and maybe new viewers. Women also have masculine energy, feminine energy. We both have these. You want more on that? Check out Anho's series on his main YouTube channel. So men have masculine energy by and large, predominant, and a little bit of feminine energy, just like women do. Men exert their masculine energy or use it by being dominant in the world, spreading their seed, not sexually, but physically, mentally, financially, just proliferating in life, in the dunya, right? We have to do that. As, as Muslim men, we have to do that. But this little bit of feminine energy, we're not meeting it. We don't know how to do it. Some men watch pornography. Some men give this to a woman. What is, what is feminine energy? Feminine energy is something that needs to leech onto or land on masculine energy. So this is basically what women predominantly have. So what do men do when they don't have a nice source to like attach this onto? They start talking about their problems with everyone. They start sharing their emotions overly with a woman that they don't even know yet. They start being a shoulder to cry on to everyone or they, they themselves need a shoulder to cry on. Why is this a problem? Guys, there's nothing wrong with crying as a man. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is as a man, this, this rock, this eye of the storm, that you, you, you need to put and, and let out your emotions and feelings and heart into, this one point of contact must be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what men fail today. Men make a woman the point of protection for this release of this feminine energy that they have. Now, we don't have a lot of it. So we're like, okay, what's the harm if I, you know, watch some rom-coms with her and we can do each other's nails and she can put on makeup on my face for the story, make people laugh. It seems harmful in hindsight, but essentially that's not what you're supposed to do. Allah tells you clearly, you know, I am what you think of me, right? So what are you going to do, bro? You're going to go to your woman and, and women don't really want that anyway. Or you're going to go to Allah, cry to Allah, repent to Allah, make Allah this, this, uh, this, wonderful entity this being this this allah is the source allah is the one that can relieve you of this energy not a video of of some haram stuff not another woman not any of this so i just want to make that clear because men today in large amounts are using women or even other men right i know a lot of men are watching this and let's be honest bro you're probably going around complaining and whining to other men and you're not taking action. Or you might have a friend that does that in your group. I'm not saying, you know, mental health is and suicides, you know, all time high. Definitely you want to talk to someone, talk to someone. But I'm saying no one likes to be around that guy that only complains to everyone and relieves and mentally masturbates that feminine energy on these people. But they don't take care of this. They don't actually take action. They're just like, oh, I'm not doing anything in life from this. But they stay there. Oh, I'm just not on my money. But they stay there. Yeah, but yeah. I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, there's a few things that I wanted to say. Uh, first and foremost, I wanna I wanna add to that and say there's there's I believe it's called istashara, but there's a difference between istashara, which is consulting, and asking for advice so you can implement it and better yourself, and complaining, right? Complaining, yes, is one of the worst things you could do, especially as a man, because men. And a a lot of their emotional stress, men feel they need to deal with it. They need to physically do something. That's why when men are stressed, sometimes they go out and do work. They work out. They get physical. As a man, if you're complaining and not doing something about it, it's going to make you feel even worse. If you complain to Allah, like Ya'qub, you're not going to feel worse about it. Because complaining to Allah is complaining to the only one who can help you, the only one who can fix it, especially if you're making dua and asking Allah to help you with it. And I want to make that, I wanted to make that very clear. Asking for advice to better yourself is not the same as complaining. Just don't complain. And make sure that if you do end up complaining, you turn it into seeking advice and think about what you can do better and, and consult people on that. I want to talk, uh, Mahdi, you made a point. And there's something I want to, to, to comment on. Oh, yes. Uh, blaming yourself. I think this is so important. So important to blame yourself, even when you're not wrong, I think is important, but there is an extreme that I fell into when doing this. So I don't want anyone to, and I know this isn't what you meant, but I know people may misunderstand it. If a woman like cheats on you, Mm. there is possibly a level of fault you have for that happening. Mm. Perhaps you were off game and she was no longer attracted to you. Maybe you chose the wrong woman. There are things you did wrong, but to blame the action as if you're getting the sin, don't do that. 
you need to also hold her accountable for what she does wrong. But what's the, what's the point? There's only one thing you could do, which is better yourself. You can't better yourself if you don't admit that you made mistakes because you did make a mistake, which was being with her, go, getting off your game, whatever it is. So you need to fix that. And that's what the brother was saying. And I, I backed it up 100%, mashallah. May Allah bless you for that. I made that distinction, actually, actually, Rami, because what I just said could be interpreted as, okay, if the presumption is I'm always wrong, I'm never going to hold my woman accountable because mm. I'm always wrong. So I'm yeah. glad you made that distinction there. That's an important distinction. Yeah. Um, no, you need to check your woman from, uh, from time to time. She needs to be checked. Some women need more checking than others. Mm. What I guess what I was referring more to was, as a gen generally speaking, as a as a point of as a mental point of origin, if you come from that place more often than not, it puts you in a position of control, mm. and that's what you want. Control is good. Don't think control mm. is bad. Control is good. Out of control is bad. Yeah. But I, I'm glad you made that point, Rami. That's an important distinction because anything taken, any virtue taken to ex is extreme becomes a vice. So Jazakallah khair for that distinction. I wanted to touch on a point Fayyad was talking about just, just now as well, uh, about you know the, the masculine energy and the feminine energy. And you know women will often say, no, I want my man to talk to me about his problems. Mm -hmm. No, you don't. Habib, no, you don't. You might think you want him to, but the equivalent of a man breaking down and complaining and moaning to you about his problems is the same as the following. Who's the president of America right now? What's his name? Joe Biden. Joe Biden. I wanted to imagine Joe Biden comes and does a press conference tomorrow and he gets on the mic. This is the leader of the United States of America, right? Mm -hmm. He's the president. He's the leader. He comes on the mic tomorrow and he, his opening sermon is, guys, I'm having a hard time. I'm breaking down. I don't know what to do next. Life's really getting to me. How do you feel about or, his, your... Or the general of an army. Pardon? I said, or imagine the general of an army does right, that. The general of an army. The general of the army, who's meant to be leading you to victory over the savages over there, the barbarians. And he turns around and says, hey, yo, man, them. I don't know, man. Like, I'm not too sure. Um, I'm, I'm starting to get a bit scared. Uh, that guy's looking like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. You're going to lose respect for this guy. Like, you're not going to feel like this individual is leading us somewhere. Now, I'm not saying, I, I think it was Rami who mentioned just now, that you shouldn't. No, you should consult. You should talk. But do it in a constructive manner where you're seeking advice, not right. just complaining for the sake of it. Complaining for the sake of it, that's between you and Allah. I complain all the time with my head on the floor. Everything that I want to say just for the sake of complaining, mm -hmm. I do that to Allah for two reasons. Number one, he's the only one who can change my situation anyway. And number two, what am I going to be a for? I complain and then what? How did my situation change? If I'm speaking to just regular people. No, if I have a, an issue that needs addressing, I will approach it from a point of advice. Brother, can I tell you what my problem is? I would like some advice. This mm. is good. This is constructive. This is okay. This is what I'm experiencing. Um, you know, do you have any solutions you could offer me? No problem. That's good. But to come at, oh, bro, life's so hard and I'm breaking down. First of all, he don't care. I'm just telling you. He doesn't care. And he doesn't want to hear this. Yeah, people who are, it's one of the laws of power, avoid the unhappy and the unlucky. People who complain all the time are not a pleasant, not pleasant to be around. The only one who wants to hear your complaints is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because he's the only one who can fix it. Mm -hmm. 100%, bro. Uh, the bare bones, my bad, I'll let you run in a second, but the bare bones of everything that we're saying here is uh, take ownership and stop playing the victim. Mm. Yeah. 100%. Facts, bro. And and when Mahdi said uh, before you go that, you know, you need to check your wife sometimes, bro. So many feminists are going to get heated on this, but understand too that a man with a disobedient wife, there's a hadith where the Prophet was saying a man with a disobedient wife will never smell the fragrance of Jannah. You feel me? So it's like, as a woman, you're not going to be held accountable for what I did as my wife. As your husband, I will be though for what you did. Absolutely. So that's that, that's that difference. Yes, Islam is unapologetically a patriarchal religion. Yes, we can have four spouses a woman can't or up to. But it comes with responsibility. And I feel like a lot of women emotionally disregard the weight that it takes to be a high-value man today. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that, Fayyad. They emotionally disregard what it takes to become a high-value man. They have no clue 
how hot, none whatsoever, especially in the, 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 the day of, 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 I'm not going to say the word because I think it's a censored word, OF, just fans, we'll say just fans, right? Now, obviously- I mean, this, I already said it, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's a censored word. I don't even know why it's a censored mm-hmm. word. And Mohim. So in the day of, of, of just fans, I don't know how many Muslim sisters are taking advantage of that, but the point I'm trying to make is it's so easy for girls to make $100,000 a year on just fans she thinks, well, if I can make 100000 so easily, it must be easy for you too, Mr. Man. And, and guys are like, no, it's not. We actually have to go out there and build something, something substantial. By the way, Just Fans was built by a man, lo and behold, right? We have to go out there and build something. And a lot of women don't get it. They just think that, you know, money falls, grows on trees or something. I don't know. I get my paycheck from the government every week. Why don't, why don't you have oh. your that reminds me of uh, if you're ever playing Call of Duty and you play with bots and you play on recruit difficulty, you're going to think that you're just a dom in the whole game. You're the king of the hill. And then you go online and you get your ass humbled and you play with actual players. And that's exactly what Mahdi's saying. You, Women, I hate, bro, I hate to say it, but today the, most women are living on recruit difficulty, bro. I hate to say it, but this is the reality of the situation. And they don't realize that. And women hyperimpose their... I want to use a better word, their feminine frame into a man. No, I have a better word. Women hyperimpose their imperative on a man. What do I mean by this? Women think that men operate the same way. A woman, once she has a man that she mentally, physically, and energetically submits to, she doesn't want another man. They're not going to like that word, submit. <laughs> submit, okay. All right, all right. I'm going to say that no, anyway, no, Don't bro. change it. I like it. But I want submit. To when they submit to a man, they don't want another man. Men can give a woman his love, bread, anything, a roof over their head, and he still will be okay sleeping with another woman. Why? Because it's in us. We don't have that monogamous, energetic need to just put it out. So women, because they operate that way, they think and they project that onto a man. And they think, okay, society is already telling me men and women are equal. Feminism, who was strangely founded by a man which is sus but feminism tells me men and women are equal everyone's the same we can all be this one androgynous gender neutral thing if that's what it is then men must operate like us too right so a man must share his feelings with me a man must you know do this we're all equal so a man why wouldn't he be happy with me ah because i'm not enough for him oh okay men are trash this is how the female brain thinks It's not that men are trash, and it's also definitely not that you are not enough for him, but men naturally might want variety. There's a reason Allah didn't make us monogamous or having to be monogamous as no other way. Like, no, there's, bro, Prophet Sallallahu I believe, had nine or 11 wives at one point. Because, yeah, because Allah just didn't want to make it, you know, hard for him. And he was exempted from that. There's the specific sunnah, like Brother Mahdi talks about often, that we as the ummah cannot even follow. Right? Because those were only for the Rasulullah That was one of them. So we can have up to four. Doesn't mean we have to have up to four. Doesn't mean we have to even have three. We could have one. But the point is, basically what I said. No, you're right. You summed it up perfectly when you said they project their, their imperative, how they feel, upon men and i've had women in my inbox like say to me my husband he wants to get married again you know am i not enough for him what's going on and i have to like repetitively explain no sister it's a possibility by the way if you're depriving him of his rights or you're bent out of shape and you're not looking good there's a possibility that 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 might be the case but usually it's just him following his fitra and it's not connected to you and that should be good news for the sister sister it's not because you're not enough it's because that's him on his fitra you know yeah. um, but again i don't recommend men i've done polygyny the bad way the bad way but what i mean by that is i had a sister offer herself to me essentially a misyard contract which is where she forsakes her rights for nights and and uh, provision i don't recommend it because it puts you in a in a unfavorable position as a man you have no leverage because you're not providing mm-hmm. and she's going as she she's upon her fitra which is to be provided for so even if she's verbally said it to you because she thinks, you know, yeah, this is going to work. Ultimately, once that honeymoon phase passes, no, it doesn't work. Yeah. If you're going to do polygyny as a man, then you're going to have to break that glass ceiling of the, the high value man. 
if you really want to do it and make it work. Because otherwise, you're just going to have a revolving door of women coming in, coming out, having kids left and right, broken mm. homes, broken families. We don't want this. Yeah. As men, we want to build. But in the process of us building our empires, our families, we don't want to destroy what's behind us at the same time. Yeah. That's a, there's, no, there's no point in that. So yeah. if you want to do polygyny, brothers watching this, more power to you. Just make sure you are the proverbial high-value man first. Now, and that's not a shari. Uh, need but I'm telling you as a matter of advice if you want to be able to command that respect from a woman you are going to have to check those boxes as what we have defined the high value man at the start of this video yeah 100% 100% yeah. Um, so I want to make a point on, on the concept of variety right because um, having a variety does not mean that what you have is not good enough. And I'm not, I'm not comparing women to cars. I'm comparing variety to variety. So I don't want anyone to misunderstand this uh, <laughs> yeah, analogy. Yeah. Um, bro, the woman, they get so mad. Lolly. Uh, I get it as well. <laughs> Subhanallah. But <clears throat> Bismillah. So let's say you have someone who's rich, who's able to, to buy as many cars as he wants. He gets an orange Lamborghini. He loves it so much. He loves it so much that he actually, now he wants a green Lamborghini as well. So he gets a green one. Does that mean something's wrong with the orange one? No. Does that mean he doesn't love the orange one? No. Does that mean the orange one is worthless? No, it's worth the same amount as the, the green one. And then he gets a red, then he gets a blue. And he loves all of them. And he puts them all in a, a beautiful garage and covers them and, and takes care of them and pays $50 at Denny's car wash to get it cleaned um, every week and all this stuff, subhanAllah. So that's the idea of variety without having some kind of deprecation or degradation of a woman and her value so that's you can compare the variety of a man and, and his wives to a variety of a person in the cars um and what i wanted to say before in the other discussion we were having is i wanted to just summarize it by saying that complacency without action is basically admission of defeat because you're you're complaining and you're basically admitting this is my life i can't do anything about it and that's admission of defeat and as a man that's the worst feeling in the world because like i said we want to we want to fix our problems. Like, uh, like Mahdi said, we want to build, right? And if, if, if we need to build to solve our problems, that's what we got to do. Um, Fayad, you asked about gender roles uh, before, and we, we haven't really gotten to that discussion yet. Yo, maybe we'll do next episode, bro. Because I want to go, go in on birth control, <laughs> gender roles, and all that. I think this might be a, it'll be too long. Because people have short attention spans, bro. I'd rather make two one-hour episodes than one two-hour episode. That is fair. That is fair. I, I, want, I want to touch on <clears throat> uh, divorcees because th this is something that I've been doing yeah, yeah. a lot. Uh, is, before I go there, do you brothers have any specific questions you wanted to ask me? Maybe something I didn't make clear enough in some of no, my I wanted to, I wanted to share something with you, bro. I already DM'd you, but let me, let me say it for the viewers, bro. <laughs> let me expose our DMs. I DM'd you about my mom when she watched one of your videos. And my mom, she sent me a message one day. And my mom watched this. Mom, I love you. <laughs> she told me. Mahdi's video fully made it like unequivocally clear that a divorcee and a widow, two different things, two different women for marriage, for spouses, for an ideal life partner that you want to spend the here, the dunya and the akhira with. They're two different things. And a lot of women think, okay, a single woman or a single mom is two different, is, is the same thing. No, they're not. So yeah, I think I think you're gonna go in on that because people people need to know that, bro. A single mom, if she's a divorcee, not the same as a widow. One hundred, and uh, I have personal experience, and then I'm gonna give you something else. If the viewers don't believe me, you can search it for yourself and watch it for yourself. So, personal, I have married a divorcee and I've married a widow. Now, my experience doesn't necessarily mean that that's the experience of everyone, but I will tell you firstly and foremostly. I put that as a disclaimer, and now I will tell you my experience. It's like the distance between the heavens and the earth in terms of their ability to pair bond. And the data is clear, by the way. The more intimate partners a woman has, the less able she is to pair bond in the first place. However, there is a the, the, there's a fundamental difference in how the woman was broken. And I say broken not in a negative sense, but when you go through divorce, you're broken in a way. When you lose a spouse, it breaks you in a way. That's fine. It's not a negative thing. But the way they break are completely different. And I would explain as follows. A divorced woman is broken in a way that embitters her towards men. Usually it makes her bitter towards men. 
especially if she feels like she's the victim and maybe she was a victim but generally speaking it, you know it takes two two to tango but if she feels like she was wronged she is now broken in a way that embitters her towards men she's less likely to give her all to the next man a widow is also broken but she's broken in a way that endears her towards men it makes men feel like something to like to want to take care of her she's not broken in a way that pushes men away and the best way for me to explain this is just by simply advising you who's watching this right now go on to netflix there's a 10 uh, episode season called the single wives it's with matthew hussey who's a world-renowned dating coach i don't mm-hmm. agree with most of what he says but that's irrelevant <laughs> yeah same right but what the point here is that there's four women on this program and there's two in particular i want you to pay attention to the twice divorcee and the widow. And you're going to see, I don't want to spoil the program for you, the twice divorcee, how she makes these guys jump through hoops for her. And in the end, she, she backs off all of them. Mm-hmm. And how the widow, subhanAllah, is hot. She's still crying over her husband. Ten years later, never been in a relationship. The first man she comes across, she latches onto him. He's a decent bloke as well, by the way. Like He's a nice bloke. The first, She's not pushing him away. So a widow is broken in a way that endears her towards men, whereas divorcees tend to be broken in a manner that pushes men away from them. Now, I can hear the sister saying, so what should we do with the divorcees then? It's sunnah to marry divorcee. Prophet ﷺ married divorcees. Well, I say to you, be careful when you say the statement, it's sunnah to marry divorcee. And this is a separate discussion. Yes, the Prophet ﷺ did it, but did he recommend it? The Prophet ﷺ used to walk around with his top two buttons undone. Right, that was from his sunnah. That doesn't mean that there's ajr in doing that. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, some sunan, which is the plural of sunnah, not only are they not recommended, they are categorically prohibited from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Is he had nine wives in one time? From the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that he fasted consecutive day and night. From the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah is that he would pray the whole night, and he prohibited us from doing that. He prohibited us from praying the whole night. He prohibited us from fasting day and night around the clock. And yet he did it. That was from his sunnah. So we have to understand what this word means. Now, is there a specific hadith or mention? Because the principle we take from this, the fiqhi principle is that we take the qawl, the speech of the Prophet as precedence over what he did. If what he said and what he did are in harmony, no problem. But if he said something and did something else, we take what he said as the principle. For example, he said, marry four wives, maximum. He did marry nine wives. So we take what he said, because there are always exceptions for the messenger, for the prophets. They have to do loads of extra stuff. For example, the qiyam, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the night prayer was fard upon the, the prophet. Yeah, it was, yeah. Fard upon them, right? So there's things, extra things they have to do. So the principle is we take what he said. He said, marry four wives. So we marry maximum four. Now, did the Prophet ﷺ say you should marry a divorcee? There is not one hadith, not one ayah, which mentions the reward. Not, I, I want to be careful with my wording here. That mentions the, like, it's a favorable thing to, t- to marry a divorcee. You will not find this. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did encourage us to take care of the widow and her orphan children. And he said, if I'm not mistaken, that we will be like this in Jannah indicating the difference between himself and yourself, right? He mentioned the virtues of marrying a virgin girl. He mentioned this when he, when he I don't want to say chastised, but when he pulled up, I believe it was Jabir, who married an older woman. And he said, well, why didn't you marry a young woman? And you can, you know, play with her and so on. And then he, Jabir, Jabir explained, I needed her to take care of my sisters. And he said, okay, that's fine. The point is, He made a reference towards marrying a virgin. He made a reference towards taking care of the widow. There is no specific reference towards marrying a divorcee. The affair is open. If you want to, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. But when we say it's sunnah, what translates in the people's head is it's recommended. Now I ask you, Ya Abdullah, watching this, if we are to tell the people it's sunnah to marry divorcees, what message are you sending that sister who feels unhappy in her marriage right now and is considering divorce? What message are you sending her? What you are telling her is, well, you know what? The brothers are saying it's similar to marry divorcees. Bandis, I'm out. Let me get out of this marriage. 
80% of all divorces are initiated by women. The vast majority of them did not experience domestic violence before I hear that in the comments as well. Most women initiate divorce because they became disenchanted. And I've mentioned this in one of my other videos from a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you find it in Bukhari and the sisters are not going to like this and I don't give a hot damn because this hadith is in Bukhari. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I saw the hellfire and I saw the majority of its, of its inhabit inhabitants were women. And the companions asked, why is this? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, they are ungrateful. And the word he used was kafar, kafara, kufur. Kufur, one of the, uh, de the definitions of kufur is ingratitude. Okay, it's not just disbelief, it can mean ingratitude. And he said, ungrateful, the, the companion said, ungrateful to whom? And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, ungrateful to their husbands. He can do a lifetime of good for her. And then he does one, and I'm paraphrasing, and then he does one thing, which is to her distaste, and she turns around and says to him, what did you do for me? What have you ever done for me? And this is why the majority of the inhabitants of the hellfire, as per the hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are women. What's my point? My point is this, most women initiate divorce, not because they were oppressed, but because they became disenchanted. So when you, Abdullah, tell the brothers, not you, Ikhwan, I'm just speaking to the viewer. You tell the brothers, brothers, it's sunnah to marry divorcees. Be specific. Say it is a sunnah, but not necessarily the sunnah. The sunnah. There's also point? a hadith where the Prophet was saying, if I were to tell women to prostrate to any, anyone other than Allah, it would be to their husbands. So you tell me how, how this whole masculine, feminine, gender roles, dominant, submissive patriarchy doesn't exist in Islam. Oh, yeah. Uh, Islam is a patriarchal religion. But patriarchy is responsibility. This is the part that they miss. Patriarchy mm -hmm. is responsibility. A respons who has, look, the more, res the more responsibility you have, the more accountability you have. Don't think, oh, patriarchy, no. Just as the brothers mentioned on the island, the women went into this communitarian mode. Nobody wanted to, to, to have a leadership role. Why? Because altruistic motives? No. Because nobody wanted to be held responsible, accountable for the bad things that inevitably happen when you're a leader. Yeah, 100%, bro. Man, on her, bro. Facts. You've been awfully quiet for a while. I have not been quiet, but listen, in the island, in the survival, whatever it's called, uh, they got to a point where they released two piggies in the the women's island was it and, like, they released them then is that true? bro it they released they, them they, they bro they released them bro. there's no way that there's no way two piggies pot, like yeah. spawned out of nowhere they bro. kept it as pets yeah bro they they were literally petting them they named them they were like they had them on leashes and everything and at the end when they were going to move bases and go somewhere else they let the piggies go bro they let <laughs> yeah. the piggies go yeah, and then the piggies true. came back yeah, and then it's like, bro, they, yeah. they were like deciding, like they, they couldn't decide on like whether they should kill the pigs or not. Yeah, and it's like, no. dude, if, if as a group of men, if we were surviving and we found two little piggies, I'm it's sorry, but hey, yeah. hey, Slaughter it's permissible if, if we need it, right? And then at the end of the day, too, uh, there's another thing that I wanted to touch on here. What, what was it, bro? What was it? Uh, I forgot, bro. That is what it is. Thing about single moms, with what Mahdi said. Um. Yeah, I, I can see that hundred percent. Okay. Because I wanted to, I wanted to say a quick disclaimer for a PSA. We're not talking about every woman. I we're not talking about every case, every domestic affair. I'm not trying to get involved in these, but understand that yes, women do get abused, just like men do get abused. But my point is, some men genuinely can't handle their weight can't carry their weight they're bad fathers yes i understand women leave they should we're talking about most cases we're not talking about every case we're talking about most mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. we don't want anyone having this emotional butthurt response to what we're saying we're talking about most cases today um are because women just don't feel it anymore the guy doesn't do it and they're sold this fairy tale lie by bro one thing that pisses me off today and more than anything is this whole cardi b city girl shit i'm not pissed off by feminism as much as this ratchet behavior mm. and yes cardi b megan the stallion whatever bro stallion literally means male horse bro the penis envy is real but all these women they say do this do that because they can because at the end of the day they still got the money mm. but what man will put up with your ratchet behavior no man so the, you're 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 buying this fairy tale lie sold by these women 
And in reality, this doesn't work for you. And I mean, then you have this dissonance. That those these women who adopt that mentality by 2030, I believe it was uh, Merrill Lynch. I don't remember which bank done this research, but by 2030, they predict that 45 percent of all women aged 25 to 45 will be single and childless. An entire economy, a bank done this research. Why? Because an entire economy is preparing to take advantage monetarily from the spinsterhood of 50 percent of the population. It's insane. That's crazy. And whole, a whole economy is being prepared for them. And, you know, on the point you mentioned, Fayyad, because it's an important distinction, that, yes, to the divorcees, there are exceptions to the rule. I, I accept and I agree with that. The problem is 99% of divorcee sisters who see this will think they're the exception to the rule. Mm-hmm. And the likelihood is, my sister, if you're watching this now, you're, you're probably not it. So you need to operate from that standpoint. You remember what I said to the brothers at the beginning? Operate from a position of, you know what? It was on me. I need to fix this. I need to take ownership. I need to fix this. Well, I tell the sisters the same thing. Sisters, you need to operate from a position of, I messed up. It was on me. Or I contributed towards the downfall of this marriage somehow. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, has a, a, a proverb. He said, the, the wife with the long, long tongue has the shortest marriage. Did you whip <laughs> your husband with your tongue? A man might hit you with his hand, but you hit him with your tongue. That's how you hit him. So take ownership. Stop hiding from it. Take ownership. The truth will set you free. Doesn't mean it'll be easy, but it will set you free. Yeah. One thing I learned, bro, is, is, is uh, bro, I'm echoing somewhere. Yeah, I hear that too. You hear that too? Yeah. Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. Alhamdulillah. Bismillah, bro. One thing I, I see today more than ever is feminism, liberalism, modernism. All it's telling women is you have the same options in the sexual marketplace, as in for men. You have the same options of men when you're 18, when you're 30. This is a lie. Yeah, this is essentially what, what the, the whole, what Kevin Samuels, all he posts about is, is basically from, that's his motive, just to expose that lie. I get it. People hate him for it. And, and people hate us for, for just spreading the truth and message, but that's the reality. A woman when she's 18 has far more options than a woman who's 30. But society's telling her, hey, you can get that career. Bro, we don't, we don't give a damn about your degrees, bro. I just want to let you guys... <laughs> Any woman watching this right now, we, we really don't care. Can you? Okay, yeah, sure. I don't, I don't really care. I don't have an issue against it, but you're not going up in my eyes with, with that piece of paper. I even a man wouldn't go up in my eyes with a piece of paper. I don't, I think that's worthless, but that's not my point. My point is a woman who's 18 is being fed this lie that she is categorically on par with a woman who's, who's 30. The 18 year old is the same with 30. And that's a lie. See the 30 year old took that advice, went through school, became, you know, lawyer. And then hypergamy, what does hypergamy mean? You only date up, you only marry up, you only procreate up. So she's limiting her pool of viable candidates by taking the route that feminism is doing. Why? Okay, so she doesn't get married. She less kids, less population. That's what the agenda wants. Yeah. Guys, so, I'm literally thinking we're going to have to put a disclaimer in the beginning of every video saying follow us on Instagram so we can pro- if we can announce our new channel once this channel gets <laughs> taken down, bro. I'm literally telling you this is going to happen one day, bro. That's what they mentioned there, Fire, about women who become more successful. I watched a, a video by Dr. P- Jordan Peterson the other day, Dr. Jordan Peterson. And um, he said, the data is clear. You know, Jordan Peterson is like, he's a numbers guy, he's a data guy. And I like that. Uh, feelings aside, I want to know what the raw data is. And he said, the data is clear. The higher a woman's IQ, the less likely she is to get married. Yeah. Now, the lady, well, you want young and dumb. Yes, correct. We want young and dumb. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by young and dumb. A lot of sisters think that their experience is an asset. I would like to make it categorically clear to the sisters watching. Sisters, your experience is a hindrance. You think it's an asset because you value experience in a man. Men don't value the same things you value. We value different things. If you're looking for a leader, then what does it stand to reason that the leader is looking for? (laughs) Leaders are looking for followers. Who make the best followers? I'll tell you. When Amazon, Facebook, Google, even a small company, when they're recruiting for the for uh, positions where they want to groom the employees, they want to groom them, they tend to go for young blood. It's an actual term. 
uh, mm. many years ago, I, uh, my father wanted me to apply for British Airways. And he said to me, Mahdi, this is your last year. You'll be able to apply. You're 24. At 25 is the cutoff. Why is that? Because young people, it's easier to teach them. It's easier to mold them into the company culture. Yes. Same goes in marriage. Men want to be able to mold his woman into his company culture, his husband culture. It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. It doesn't mean the woman's current culture is right or wrong. It's not about right and wrong. Amazon have a culture. Facebook have a culture. Both are successful. But Amazon will not tolerate Facebook culture in their company. Facebook will not tolerate Amazon culture in their company. So when it comes to recruiting for young blood that they can groom, they go for young, young people, young human beings. Now, what does the likes of Amazon and Facebook do when they're recruiting for C-suite positions, executive positions? They look for people who have experience. Why? Because when you're recruiting for a leader, these are leadership positions, CFO, COO, CEO, leadership positions require experience. Sisters, you're looking for the CEO. That's why you value experience. Your husband-to-be is looking for the assembly line guy. That's why he doesn't value experience. Not diminishing you, just explaining to you. We look for different things in each other. Yeah. Yes, that's why it's true that, that men chase championships, women chase champions. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Very good. No? Yeah, yeah. I heard that a long time ago uh, when I was into the whole uh, PUA dating multiple plates and all that stuff. Jailia days, guys. Jailia days. Champion and championships thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's true, though. SubhanAllah, it's true. Uh, there, there are a few things I, I want to mention here, inshallah. So, bismillah. Firstly, on the, the hadith that Mahdi, you mentioned. Um, actually, I learned about this hadith recently. Because uh, a lot of people like to use it to like attack Islam. So, I want to make it clear that it's very possible. And it actually seems to be the case that the reason that... So, firstly, I want to I agree that the reason women go to hellfire to be punished for certain sins, the gravest sins that are easiest for them to do, especially in jahiliyyah, one, being ungrateful to their husband. It's something that's almost like natural to a lot of women and they don't even realize. Gossiping is another thing that's mentioned um, and backbiting and frequently cursing and things like that. And these are all reasons. It's, they're all reasons. And there are other mentioned as well. But there's also a hadith that mentions like, for example, towards the end of time, for every one man would be 50 women. So there's just more women in general, which means that majority of human, the human race is female, which means majority of people in Jannah and Jahannam would be women and the prophet said use this as a talking point to get their attention because it's not a lie it's true and why are they there for those reasons so it's still true so i wanted to, i wanted to mention that because i thought it was interesting for you. well better keep happy may allah bless you um that's, that's a good, cl good clarification actually yeah. jazakallah khair. may allah bless you bro um also i want to ask a question because there are still going to be the women that are like you know no 30 18 same thing no doesn't matter if, yeah, yeah, yeah. if you had a if you had a dice that you had you had to roll and there's a 50% chance you'd be 30 and single and a 50% chance you'd be 22 and single. Would you, would you actually want to roll that dice? Would you be hopeful for one or would you roll it like, oh, who cares? Be honest. <laughs> think you don't have to answer that. Just think about it. And if you say, bro, I want to be 22. Okay. If it was me, I'd rather be 30 than 22 because I'm closer to my prime. For I probably sure. built up a lot more. SubhanAllah. And uh, there was one more thing I wanted to mention. It slipped in my mind now. But uh, khair, inshallah, I've said enough. Alhamdulillah. No worries, guys. If you're a, uh, a Muslim sister that watched so far and you agree with our content, which we get most of the wise following Islam type of pious women agree with our advice. It's only the ratchet women that are unruly and victims of propaganda that can't. I hate to sound harsh, but I'm just being, I'm just being real with you. Yes. So the women that made it this far comment down below because anytime you comment on the algorithm it pumps it up gets most likes a woman agreeing with them really and then you know people like that so i'll pin your comment bro and if you're a woman who disagrees with us please comment too yeah. dislike the video too <laughs> i don't need your likes <laughs> i want i want to i want to speak my truth i want i want these brothers want to speak their truth you, you know what i think it is too mm. i think it's just um i think it's misinformation or just misinterpretation better yet because uh if you get a proper woman like that that uh milan girl that we had here yeah. uh, may allah bless her Amen. but like she understood she understood all the things that we're saying here 
And like when she said what she said, it also allowed a whole bunch of other women to understand. Yeah. But it's like we live in the time where misinterpretation and misinformation is all around us. And it's like, bro, they, we can't we can't sit here and act like there's not a, uh, a movement, something that's happening to try to get women to uh, think in a certain way, act in a certain way. I mean, just look at it. Just look at it. So, like, if we were to take that out, we would strip it away. And what Gabriel says, if, if women were to return back to their, their fitra, then they would naturally go into all the things that we are saying here. And if a man returns back to his fitra, then he also goes into the things that we are saying here. So if someone is hurt by this, if someone is, uh, you know, triggered, look, like, that's on you. Like, you're the one that needs to strip everything away and see it for what it really is instead of getting butthurt about something. Yeah. Real talk. I say, we, I say we we cap it at that, bro, until next I, I episode. Wanna, I want to leave a, a small thing for the sisters. Of course, bro, of course. If you're a young sister right now, age between 17 and 24, sister, don't delay marriage for the sake of your education. I had one sister in my inbox, Jazakallah Khair. She said to me, brother, you know what? You're right. She said, I'm 30 now. I got married when I was 20. I finished my degree. I got first class with honors and I was pregnant. And she said, now I'm 30 years old. Alhamdulillah, I have three children. I'm happily married. And my single friends are still single that I went to university with. So sister, you can still complete your education if that's what you really want to do. Like Fayyad said, like, we don't care, frankly. But if that's what you really want to do and your husband's okay with it, more power to you. Fine. But don't delay for the sake of your education because that ship comes around once. Once it sets sail, that's it. You're in, you're, if, once you're 26 plus, like 30 plus, and not, you're locked into competition with the new conveyor belt of girls mm -hmm. who are younger, you know, easier to, to lead and so on and so on and so on. Less experience and so on. Don't delay. That's all. Yep. And the last thing that I want to say uh, to top off what you just said, bro, is that as men, we look at other men who have these uh, these qualifications, we'll call them, all right, we'll call them qualifications uh, or achievements. We look at other men that have these as a, a source of value. Where it's like, okay, how can he be of value either to me or to someone else? Or like if I have a group or something, how can he be of value to this group or to what I'm doing? We look at women, we see, well, we seek, like you said, we seek a different value when it comes to women and when women want to basically play the same field as men and um, go out there and go to school and do all these things again, like, look, if that's what you want to do, halas, go ahead and do it. But like, as men, we are not seeking that in a partner. Like what man in his right mind would say, you know what? I'm looking for an anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> bro, you know why that is, bro? It's because women, once again, like we Afer mentioned, they project their imperative on us men. And that is not the case. That is the farthest thing from the truth. Women go around looking at other women, career women, and they respect them. True or false? True. Now, do we? No. But women do that, right? We don't look at a woman like, oh, man, look at her masters. Damn. We don't do that, bro. But <laughs> women do that. Women look around at, at each other and they, they respect women that are richer. They respect CEO, business women, entrepreneurs, degrees, doctors, lawyers, whatever, right? I'll take Why the one say that they're shamed by those same women for not mm -hmm. having Exactly. But mm -hmm. why, why do women respect those dominant women? Because women respect and chase dominance, period. We submit and ad admire dominance anyway. It doesn't matter if it's from a man or woman. See, this whole independent boss, I don't want to curse, but whatever these ratchet girls say, these, you know, only women find those women attractive. We don't. But it's not because, you know, they're attractive. It's because women like dominant individuals, period. That's why even in lesbian couples, there's always one dom and one sub. I hate to say it, but it's, uh... it's the name of the game. But you can't project that onto men. We don't, we don't look at it the same way. We don't look at women and give them brownie points for having a degree. 100. Actually, rather, I'm gonna be, rather, I'm gonna be, rather, I'm gonna be harder on her ass now because now she has degrees. Okay, now you gotta manage two things. You gotta manage the household and your, your job. Good luck with that. I'd rather you pick one, bro, but that's just me. Yeah, the other side effect of successful career women as well, 
uh, is that, okay, in order to become successful in your career, you need to develop a high degree of disagree disagreeableness. Trait disagreeableness is, again, go to Jordan Peterson, is directly linked to success in a career. You need to be able to walk through no's. When people say no to you, you need to say, middle finger, I'm going anyway, right? This is great for a career. And this is great. Uh, these are great leadership qualities to have. Because as a leader, you need to be able to walk through no's, to walk through failure. But this is an absolutely awful trait for a woman to adopt, where she turns around and says, I don't give a damn what you say. No, I ain't doing this. No, I ain't doing that. She, so the more successful she becomes, the more her disagreeable muscles build. Now, I've heard some men say, no, but it is possible for her to be successful in her career and then be feminine at home. I disagree. I disagree. However you are throughout most of the day, it's extremely hard to be completely <laughs> opposite and when you're at home. It's like, imagine you're a masculine man and you're a masculine man throughout the daytime and then you come home and then what? You're just some feminine, soppy <laughs> thing. It's not going to happen. So again, that's another thing sisters have to bear in mind, women in general. The more successful you become, the more your disagreeable muscles have built, the more masculine you now are, the more unattractive you are towards men. Facts, bro. 100%. I say we we ended off with that. We will go more into uh, actual marriage game. You know how to maintain your marriage, nikah, uh, maybe stuff like your roles and responsibilities as a man, a woman's roles and responsibilities, a woman's menstrual cycle, birth control, how these things are all affected. We got some stuff to say next episode. Guys, if you made it this far, do not hesitate to smash that like button. I don't want your likes. I need your likes. Why? Because women... In, in terms of feminist uh, mainstream media, we're already going against the grain of status quo, feminism, mainstream media. If YouTube doesn't demonetize this video, YouTube's going to demonize this video. And if that happens, mm. then, you know, dislikes are already through the roof. So we need you guys to like it and balance equilibrium. But with that being said, bro, if you guys have nothing to say, Rami, do the honors. Um, just in case this video gets taken down, check out our Patreon. They can't take that down, inshallah. So, uh, <laughs> wait, bro, before you end it, before yeah. you end it, um, we should let people know that, uh, we got a little something, something special on Patreon that we're gonna record some extra that's not gonna go on YouTube with Mahadi, that's only going on Patreon. So, if you want to be a part of that, you know where to go, inshallah. Mm hmm. 100% man. Patreon link in description. Lowest tier start at $5 a month if you want some advanced game with Mahdi. What I wanted to say though is if you made it this far, hashtag bring Mahdi back for next episode with him, inshallah. Jazakallah khair for the time, bro. Until next time. Inshallah. With that being said, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhab al nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If society is so amazing and moral and, and progressive and first world country, then why are we suffering with these internal societal diseases? Things like drinking, things like smoking, things like zina, things like music, pornography. Why? It's because they don't actually care about morality. They care about desire.